The word of God is an interesting statement because it implies that that's what God said. God of the universe. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembrick. And I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television, a television program, of course, designed to take you from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 through the Word of God every day. We do that. We're very excited about Isaiah 54 to 56 today. Corey is here to tell us what she's doing. Corey? Some archaeological insights today pertinent to the book of Isaiah. Excellent. Very good. And uh, what did you study today? Well, I want to take Isaiah 55 and link it up with one of the Psalms, so stay tuned. All right. Very good. And Ryan is here to tell us what he's doing. Ryan? Well, today in our studies, we're headed for one of the most remote locations on the planet, Easter Island. All right, that is a great Easter Island I first heard about when Chariots of the Gods came out years ago. So this is really interesting information. Get your Bible and your Bible guide and let's study. The biblical book of Isaiah was written by the prophet Isaiah and is intensely historical in nature. That is to say, he is not just recording prophecies given to him from God, but he's referencing things that actually happened in history. He tethers some of his prophecies to historical event events, and he speaks to and about historical figures in the court of Judah and elsewhere. Let's take a look at one of those figures. In the 1870s, an inscription was discovered in the area of the Silwan tombs within the limits of modern day Jerusalem and facing the ancient city of David. It was removed for preservation and sent to the British Museum, but it wouldn't be until 80 years later that it would gain the attention it deserved. In 1953, it was finally deciphered as an identifying inscription, naming Shebniyahu and his wife as the occupants of the tomb and also as a curse against anyone who would later disturb their bodies. The tomb being long disturbed, researchers were more captivated with the name Shebniyahu, which is the long form of the name Shebna. In the Bible, the prophet Isaiah lectures a Shebna who is an official in King Hezekiah's court for making himself an ornate tomb just outside of Jerusalem. Could this Shebna and the tomb's original owner have been the same man? Based on the dating of the inscription, nearly all archaeologists agree that it is likely. Comparing the inscription with known inscriptions from Hezekiah's reign proved key in solidly placing this tomb at its proper age. Along with the tomb of Shebna, two clay signet seal impressions have been found that are probably his. The first was found in excavations of Lachish in the 1960s. Lachish was the Judean defensive city that was destroyed by the Assyrians during Hezekiah's, and so also Isaiah and Shebna's, lives. Unfortunately, the seal impression here was damaged. It read, belonging to Shebna, of the king. But what was this Shebna's relationship to the king? Did the seal originally read son or servant? If servant, this could be the very seal impression from Shebna, official of Hezekiah, known to Isaiah the prophet. Luckily, in 2007, another clay seal impression was discovered that matched the seal. The same signet seal had made it. This Shebna was the king's official. The evidence for Shebna's life is compelling. Not only do we have him mentioned by Isaiah, an inscription above a tomb dating to the time of Hezekiah mentions his name, as well as two signet seal impressions. One of the really interesting aspects of these clay impressions from signet seals that archaeologists have found and that uh, different collectors, uh, antiquities collectors have in their collections is that uh, they were fired later on by enemy armies. Now, a lot of people know that Jerusalem was destroyed around 586 BC by the Babylonian army. Uh, they came in, they destroyed Jerusalem. Now, this was during the lifetime of the prophet Jeremiah. But all of those records uh, that had been kept for hundreds of years in Jerusalem uh, were exposed to fire. And a result of that fire, an unexpected result of that fire, was actually to fire uh, the, the clay impressions that were made by these signet seals that had been wrapped around, in many cases, papyrus documents to seal them. Uh, now, what firing clay does is it preserves it. It makes it hard 
hard and uh, it, it stands up then better, not only to the elements, but also just natural degradation throughout time. And uh, so it's a, it's a really interesting and kind of funny, ironic twist of history that the enemies of Israel and Jerusalem actually preserved the history of Israel and Jerusalem uh, for interested parties and biblical students today. Uh, so it's just a really fun uh, fact when it comes to the history and archaeology of Jerusalem. Bible is unique. As we read this book, we must decide whether or not it is right. The Bible is one of the most challenged books in the world. No government, dictator, or gatherings have tried to eliminate any other book as they have the Bible. The Bible is called the Word of God. Now, why do we want to eliminate it? Well, simply because the Bible tells us the historical things that are hard to hear and that we are ashamed of. No one except the Lord Jesus Christ can tell the human race what it has done wrong. But the Bible is not a book about what is horribly wrong with us. It speaks of life and how to live it well. Now the devil speaks and reveals in Genesis 3 what his attack strategy will be and what we can expect. He says, did God really say? Now that's the attack strategy. This question has troubled the human mind throughout history. Isaiah 55 verses 1 through 13. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 13.
You know, Isaiah is an amazing prophet. Uh, we go through the prophets and we learn so much. And most people think of the end times and they think of, you know, well, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. But I, I need to remind you that pretty much all of the 13 books of the New Testament quote Isaiah. He is a, an amazing writer. And, uh, and what a prophet he was. He was a, a royal prophet in the sense that he had access to the kings. He, of course, interacted with King Hezekiah at the time and King Hezekiah's death and all of that and King Hezekiah's extension of life, 15 years. I mean, Isaiah was involved in a lot of what God did. And so we need to understand that as we read his work. Listen to Isaiah 55. It says, come everyone who thirst, come to the waters and he who has no money, come buy and eat. He who has no money, Come, buy and eat. How do you buy without any money? Well, that's an interesting idea. And as we begin to focus on this chapter, we will learn some fascinating things. If you have your Bible guide, turn to today's passage. If you don't, use the address on the bottom of the screen and write to, the, write to us to get a hold of your Bible guide. We'd be happy to send it to you for a gift in any amount. Now, it's important that we understand the ways of truth. That's the way that God communicates truth to us. So in today's word, we see the ways of truth as the word of God. And this is what Isaiah is talking about. He's saying God is telling us he gave us his word. Now, if you're watching this program for the first time, let me tell you that we're going to read the word of God and you're going to get it free. I mean, it's not charged. The word of God comes to you as it comes. And so we want to make sure that you understand that. We're going to read Isaiah 54 to 56 as we continue to go through the Bible. Very important. And as we look at Isaiah 55 verses 1 to 13 today, let us hear what God is saying. Father, I pray today that we would be ready, that we would be willing to listen and then, of course, Lord, give us the courage to do what you've said for us to do. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, and if you understand who God is, listen carefully to the scripture. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, consider what we're saying from the Bible. The 66 books written by 40 authors over thousands of years, all with the same theme. Here is what the Bible says. Ho, everyone who thirst. Come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? For what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy. It doesn't. Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good. Let your soul delight in itself, itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Here your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. This is absolutely stunning. You see, what we see here is this. What we take in is what we are to put out. To whom God gives, God requires. God designs us as people who give and help, but we must read his word. Now, a lot of people read the Bible and they say, well, that helped me today. It's all about me. It helped me. It helped me. But God is conditioning our souls. When we read his word, we're understanding who he is, what he's done. And as it digests in our heart, that changes the way we are. So we become people whose heart begins to align itself with the Lord by reading the Bible. That's why we do this program. And that's what I believe, because I've read through the Bible a number of times, and God is, has changed me, and it hasn't been easy, but God has changed me through the power of His Holy Spirit and the Word of God. That is very important that we understand that, beloved. To whom much is given, much is required. And God is making us His kingdom. We go back to the scripture in chapter 4, or chapter 55, verse 4. It says, indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations 
who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he was glorified, he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are as higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now this brings us to this very interesting idea. God's thoughts are uniquely different from man's thoughts. We must hear God through his word. Again, that's the reason we do this program. So we can all hear God. When we come to the Lord and we begin to read the Bible, we pray, uh, we start, I, I believe that, you know, most people, um, all people really should start with the Lord's prayer. And you say in the Lord's prayer, Lord, thy kingdom come, your will be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We align ourselves with God. Very important. Which brings me to chapter 55, verse 10. It says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace in the mountains and the hills, shall break forth in singing before you. And all of the trees of the field shall clap their hands instead of the thorn, shall come the cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Which brings me to this concluding thought. God's word feeds and nourishes us daily. If we read it, it is an everlasting sign that will never be cut off. One of the things that people used to ask me as a pastor all the time was, what does the Lord want from me? That's a good question. And it's answered. And we'll talk about that tomorrow on the next program. So make sure that you join us because we are going to study. Ryan, what's up? Well, today we attempt to unravel what most researchers and scientists today consider to be one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the world, Easter Island. Who inhabited this island, and what are we to make of those strange stone statues that have become so famous? Lying in the midst of the South Pacific Ocean, thousands of miles away from the nearest coast, Easter Island covers roughly 64 square miles and has a maximum elevation of just 509 meters. It is known as one of the world's most remote locations, which is why it is truly remarkable that when Dutch explorer Jacob Roggeveen landed there in 1722, he found it to be inhabited. Though by this time it was a small population in reduced circumstances, inhabiting a barren, treeless land, equipped with small canoes and with no domestic animals other than chickens, it still remained home to the remnants of an intriguing culture. Appearing to have been first inhabited between AD 300 and 400, 
Easter Island, known as Rapa Nui to the indigenous peoples, seems to have once been quite prosperous. Indeed, analysis of pollen and archaeological remains shows that the island once supported a much richer ecosystem. It was forested and inhabitants used sophisticated intensive farming techniques. They built large canoes, enabling them to hunt dolphin, porpoise, and tuna, supplementing the seabirds, fish, and shellfish they could catch along the coast. Researchers also suspect that the first settlers were quite small in number, but eventually grew to a population between 4 and 20,000. Interestingly, not only were these people accomplished farmers, but it seems they also had several different classes of people, such as laborers, warriors, and priests. In fact, arising about AD 700 was a civilization responsible for constructing the now iconic stone statues called Moai, and according to the most comprehensive survey yet undertaken of the busts by archaeologist Joanne Van Tilburg, there are 887 Moai on the island, carved from hardened volcanic ash known as tuff. Though they vary greatly in size, their average height is 13 feet tall. Incredibly, the largest thus far discovered is 33 feet tall and weighs 74 tons. And apparently, one unfinished sculpture, if completed, would have been approximately 69 feet tall with a weight of about 270 tons. But there are also other elements to the moai, such as the platforms on which they were intended to rest, called ahu, as well as a circular pukeo, or caps, which might have been some sort of hair or headdress. Far from being the workings of a primitive culture, these impressively designed megalithic statues were not only creatively and thoughtfully carved, but were somehow transported and erected all over the island. And, similar to the Inca design, the platforms built for the Moai were created with such technical proficiency that no mortar was needed. Since these discoveries clearly contradict the evolutionary perception that ancient man was less evolved, a great deal of wonder, mystery, and controversy now surrounds Easter Island. In fact, some even claim that the isle was a landing site for extraterrestrials. In reality, however, these ancient people were fully capable, intelligent human beings, just as the Bible proclaims. While we don't really know all the details about the culture that existed there or how and why they built and erected the Moai, for the Bible believer, Easter Island isn't really all that elusive. See, secular researchers are at a loss to explain the obvious intelligence represented there because they believe in evolution, which requires that ancient man was much more primitive than we are today. And to get around these cold hard facts, some evolutionists have claimed that the Moai were actually created by extraterrestrials. This is known as the ancient, ancient astronaut theory. But what's more plausible, that an ancient race of aliens landed there and created these statues, or that these were made by intelligent human beings? Personally, I'll take the latter option. And according to the biblical history, that is exactly right. Ancient people were by no means primitive, but were at least as intelligent as we are today. Since the Bible teaches that God created mankind in his image, fully formed and intelligent from the beginning, we understand that the ancient people of Easter Island were intelligent, and so the fact that intelligence is represented there is no major mystery. In fact, it's to be expected. Remember, it's extremely important to use the Bible as our starting point. When we do that, the world becomes much clearer. You know, it does, and one of the things that, uh, of course, the reason that people are using the extraterrestrial is because they don't want to believe in God, mm -hmm. and they want <clears throat> to find another example. So, you know, no God, no anything. And uh, I remember that was in the, of course, the Chariots of the God movie, mm -hmm. which is, you know, old. The I remember books, yeah. as a yeah. young kid a seeing that. And, uh, but, you know, it's interesting because the history of the Bible tells us the truth. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. good. Thank you, Ryan. Excellent sure. job. What did you do? Well, we're looking at Isaiah chapter 55, and it's an invitation to abundant life. And I love how it starts. I'm going to read up to the end of verse 2. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, God says, and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Now, when I read that, I stopped there and it reminded me of the verse in Psalm 34, verse 8. 
But what I'm going to do is I have time. I'm going to read up to verse 8 in Psalm 34. And this is called the happiness of those who trust in God. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Here's verse eight. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Verse nine says, oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. And it goes on. It's very worthy for you to open up your Bible when the program's over and read Psalm 34 in its entirety. So the word of God, Jesus Christ himself said that he was the living water, mm -hmm. that he is the bread of life. And those are the things that when you taste and see the Lord, his goodness, you won't be satisfied with anything else. Yeah, that's right. That's interesting that the Psalms, of course, are in the center of the Bible mm -hmm. and tell us much about God. And it's interesting that Jesus Christ also uh, quoted scripture. There's a, we're coming up on a scripture soon that it says, my house has been a den of thieves. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ quoted that. Quotes that. He does. It, well, I, I don't know because Jesus Christ pre-existed. So was the prophet quoting Jesus Christ or was Jesus Christ quoting the prophet? I think the prophet was quoting Jesus Christ. Well, and Jesus Christ is the word. Of course, he is the word. So, And, you know, I mean, and, and therefore he's the truth. It's so, a little so, bit of an impossible <laughs> thing, man. But it kind of gives you one of those brain cramps when you think about forever, you know. Yeah. Well, that's that's true. That's true. And, and I think that it's important for us to remember that uh, this is a book about Jesus Christ. And mm -hmm. we are teaching this and we're preparing and uh, go our heart is fresh through this every single day and all of these segments you see they're new segments there's no reruns you know we're new segments every day because we are having a great time with over 733,000 words uh, now I just need to say that we need your help and if you can help us that's great I would simply ask you to pray about it we of course are involved with some people called wow or uh, widows and orphans uh, for winning and all of that and vision led in the United States and we give to them but I, I think it's important that you understand that the money we receive from you of course goes to the cameras and all those types of things so if you can help us that would be tremendously helpful and it'd be great pray about it ask what God would have you do and then if the Lord speaks to you, please just do what the Lord says. That's very important. I'm not going to get into, you know, if somebody will give 25 or 35. Or, I'm not going to do that because that's not my style. I just, you know, I don't do that. But what I do tell you is pray about it. Ask the Lord what he would have you do and uh, do that because God will help us.